Hi, I'm Mary. I'm going to live code a drum machine. I'm going to uh, write the code in JavaScript and uh, make sound using web audio uh, and draw the drum machine in Canvas. So these are all uh, browser technologies that don't require any plugins and will work in any modern browser. Um, this is the drum machine that I'll create. Uh, uh, the basic layout of a drum machine is that you have tracks in the rows and each track has a different sound. So one might be a kick drum, one might be a snare, one might be a hi-hat or a note or, or whatever. Um, and then each column is a particular moment in time. So, and then the playing is controlled by this uh, pink thing in our case. Um, and the pink square starts here and it goes bup, 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 jumping from uh, column to column. And then when it's, it gets to the end, it will go bup, bup, and then jump right back to the beginning and go bup, bup, bup. So it will go on forever. Um, and the way it works is that whenever the pink square reaches a new column, then it will just play um, any tracks for which there is a yellow square. So in this case, nothing will be played, but it'll go like and so on. Um, and by uh, having multiple tracks with uh, which playing multiple sounds at the same time, uh, each track playing a different sound at the same time, then you can uh, create drum loops or little tunes or anything you like. Um, all of the uh, code for this and uh, a running version uh, is at drum-machine.maryrosecook.com. Um, let's get started by uh, defining an uh, index page, which will just uh, host our main elements. So we're going to need a body tag. Um, and uh, I'm going to set the um, margin uh, of the body tag to zero, just so that it's, it's top left aligned. Um, and then the two important elements that we need are a canvas, uh, which I'm going to give an ID of screen, just so we can grab it back into the JavaScript in a second, um, and a width and a height. And then the second element of the um, <coughs> HTML is a script tag. And I'm just going to load one piece of JavaScript uh, in the index.js file, um, and that will contain all of our code. That's nice. And that's it for the HTML. Now we can switch over to the uh, JavaScript, and I'm just going to console.log hello, uh, just to check that everything's hooked up correctly. Um, now, uh, to run this code, all I've done is just drop this index.html page into the browser. Um, there's no server or anything like that needed. Um, and I can just refresh. And then you can see that it says hello. So it seems like our um, code is glued up to our uh, index.html. Now let's, let's get started with playing some sounds. Um, so I'm going to make this uh, run this make this note function. Um, and uh, what it takes is a audio uh, element, which will uh, is our web audio element, which allows us to actually play some sounds, um, and then a frequency. Um, and that frequency defines um, what pitch we would like the sound for this note function to play. So 440 is kind of about boo, but if it was 500, then it might be boo, or you know 700, it might be boo, or so. So the, the number controls the pitch. Um, and this note function is actually just going to return a function that will play that sound when it's invoked, because we want to just set up the note uh, function and then run it many times whenever we need to play that note. Um, so this will play a sound, but of course it won't, because note doesn't exist. Uh, so sorry, note doesn't exist. So let's solve that problem. So I'm going to define the uh, note function here. Um, and the first thing we need to do is uh, create an audio element, uh, which we just do with new audio context, which is a nice browser API. Uh, so that solves the first part. Now, um, this is the second part is the frequency, uh, which we know is going to be 440 in this particular case. Um, there's a few elements. First, we're going to return a function, which will actually play the sound. Um, and there's a few elements to generating this, this sound. But first, we're going to create a sine wave. Um, and we're going to do that with this create sine wave function. Uh, and again, this is a function we need to create ourselves. And we're going to give it a the audio element so that it can actually create it, and then a duration, which is how long we'd like the sound to play. And our duration is just going to be fixed at, at 1. <clears throat> Um, now, again, create sine wave doesn't exist, so let's go and create it. Um, you know, it takes the audio element and duration. 
Uh, and the idea here is that we want to create that sine wave um, using an oscillator. And an oscillator is uh, a capability that's built right into the Web Audio API. Uh, and an oscillator is just essentially some function that produces some sort of tone. So a sine wave is just a pure tone, just like like that. Um, and so this create oscillator function will create that tone for us. But we need to tell it what type of tone we'd like it to create. So in our case, we're just going to create a sine wave. So we just say, set the type of the oscillator to sine. Um, next, we need to tell that wave when to start playing and when to stop playing. So we can say uh, oscillator.start. Um, and we give it a time, and the time we'd actually like it to start is, is right now. Uh, so we can pass in the current time on the audio element. Uh, then we need to tell it when to stop, which will be right now plus the duration of this sound. So super easy. Um, and then we just part root return that uh, uh, oscillation that we've created. So that, that deals with creating the sine wave. Um, now, it's not actually quite enough to to play any sound yet. If you if you see that if we refresh, then things seem to go okay, but but no sound happens, um, and that's because uh, the way the way that the Web Audio API works ultimately is that it's a series of nodes where a node might create a sound and it might pass that sound to another node, which somehow modifies the sound, which might pass it to another node, and and so on. But it's not actually going to get played until it gets sent to something called the audio dot destination. Um, and we, so we need to send this sine wave to the audio destination. Uh, we've started it, we need to tell it, send it to tell the browser to actually play it. And we can do that by just calling connect. So we call connect on the sine wave and connect it to the audio destination. There we are. Um, and there we are, we have a sound. Uh, so it played for a bit. So it plays each time I refresh now. So that's great, we've got some sound, but you can hear that it's not exactly a beautiful sound really, is it? Uh, it just goes like boo and then just cuts off just like that. So we're going to make it a little nicer. Um, so the first element for that is we're going to create something called an amplifier. Um, and the amplifier will take um, the audio element again, um, some sort of start value, which is going to be the start volume, um, and then a duration for the amplification. Uh, and the amplifier itself we just create with uh, the uh, audio element again and the kind of soundy word for an amplifier in, in web audio uh, its terms is, is a gain um, so we could just call it we just use create gain we're going to return it the thing is though what we want to do with the amplification of the sine wave is we want it to start off at some kind of you know reasonably loud volume and then we want to ramp it down pretty fast to almost zero and that will give the sound instead of just being like boop and then just cutting off, it'll be like boo, just like that, just slow down, and it'll give it a kind of nice reverb effect. So we're going to define this function ramp down, which will ramp down the gain or the amplification of the sine wave. So um, we're going to say uh, that the um, thing we want to ramp down is the amplifier here, um, and we're going to pass in the audio element again, and we're going to pass in the amplifier's gain element, which is, its, like I said, its volume. Uh, and then we need to tell it what to start the value at, which is whatever was passed in for the create amplifier start value, so something like 0 0.4, which would be about half uh, full volume. Uh, and then we finally pass it a um, uh, the duration here, that is the time we would like it to ramp down that value over. So ramp down, as you can see, doesn't exist, so we need to create it. Um, so it's going to take all those elements, audio, the item to ramp down, um, the value basically, uh, the start value and the duration. Um, and there's two pieces to this. Um, remember that the item is amplifier.gain, so we're going to make some changes to what that gain value is. And the first change is we're going to set its, its start value. And so we want to set its start value to whatever our start value is. So if we want the uh, sine wave to start at playing an at an amplification of 0 0.4 out of 1, sine value, start value would be uh, 0 0.4. Uh, and then we tell it when we would like to set that value, and the answer is right now. Um, so that's the thing, that's the first part, what it starts at. The next part is how it ramps down. And for this, we're going to use a super cool function called... Um, exponential ramp to value at time. So the idea here is that though it may start off at 0 0.4, we want to ramp it down exponentially pretty fast 
to essentially zero. So we pass in, hey, we'd like to you to ramp down to almost zero. And the time we'd like to, you to get to that almost zero value is when the sound is over. So current time plus the duration. Um, and that will give us uh, a nice uh, gain curve, which just starts at a reasonable value and goes down. And it will give us a nice reverb effect. So the final piece for that is to actually involve the amplifier somehow here. So um, we could just do like sine wave dot connect and pass in the amplifier that we create here and then connect the amplifier to the destination. But that, that's a bit laborious and kind of hard to read. So we're going to make a function called chain. And all chain does is just takes a bunch of notes, sound nodes and chains them together. Super simple. So it takes some items uh, and it just loops through them uh, until the penultimate one. And Just connect each one to the next one. So we just start at the first one and connect it to the second one, connect the second one to the third one, and so on until we're out of items. Uh, so we can do that with this. And we're done. So now we can use chain to make this look much nicer. So we want to chain the sine wave to the amplifier that we're going to create here. I'm going to start at 0 0.2 and a duration of whatever the duration is. And then we finally connect that to the audio dot destination. So we've got three nice nodes here connected together. And that looks pretty readable and cool. Let's, let's play that again. OK, that sounds lovely. So now it's got this nice reverb effect where it just kind of fades off into the distance. Sounds much nicer. So each time I refresh again, it just plays the sound. That's great, that sounds good. Now let's, now let's focus on the drum machine for a bit. So I'm gonna make my uh, data structure, which contains all the data for the drum machine. Um, and this is super simple, it just has two elements, a step, um, which is uh, zero. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, let's have a look. So here's the drum machine that we're gonna be aiming for. Um, the, you can see that uh, each, there's, it has a series of rows, and each row is a track. And a track is just has a sound associated with it. So it might be a kick drum or a snare drum or a particular note that was being played. Um, and the way the drum machine works is that it just loops from the start to the end and then comes back to the beginning. So um, let's, say, let's say this track was a kick drum, or let's say this track was a kick drum. Um, then the stepper, that, that, per, that pink block there, would just start at zero and then go dub, 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 and so on. And then any time it hits a square that has is on, that is yellow, it will play. So it would be like and so on. And so it just plays on the notes that are yellow. So with this, you can build up a simple drum loop because you can imagine that if another track was like a snare and then another track was maybe a hi-hat or something like that, you could just arrange which notes were on so that they played in unison so that you get a nice drum beat or so. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, so our step in that example is just the position of the pink rectangle. Um, so step zero, step one, step two, step three, step four, and so on. So that's nice. The other element that we need for our data, the only other element, is tracks. Um, and this is just an array, and each track is a row here. So it's track zero, track one, track two, track three, and so on. And like I said, each track has a sound associated with it. So you have the snare track, the kick track, and so on. So that's our data description. Um, now uh, let's, let's, let's create a track. So we're going to call create track. Uh, which doesn't exist yet, um, and we're going to pass in the um, color that we would like to represent that track, which in this case is going to be gold. Um, so that the, the the nodes in this track, sorry, the um, uh, buttons in this track that are on will be gold, and the ones that are off will be gray. And then we need to pass in a sound that will be played every time it, uh, there's a gray box. Sorry, uh, uh, one of the buttons is on. So to do that, we can just use our old friend note, uh, which takes, as we know, the audio element and the pitch of the sound to play. So we're pretty much good to go there, except of course we haven't got create track. Oops. All right. So we know that create track takes um, a color and a play sound. And all it's going to do is create an array of steps. And a step is just 
on or off, true or false. Um, and so we're going to have 16 steps for each track from left to right there. So this, this, this track down here would be false, 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 true, false, 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 and so on. Um, so this is going to be an array of 16 steps. So we need to build it. Uh, and that's super simple. We just push on a false onto the array because start everything as off. Um, and then we return our track, which we uh, has the steps on it, of course. Um, it has the color, which is whatever we passed in, and it has the play sound, which is whatever we passed in, which is the function that will actually play the sound associated with this track. So great. So um, now we've got no errors, which is great, but of course we're not drawing anything yet because we haven't written any draw code. So let's start by instantiating the screen. The screen is going to be just a, an object, which is a bundle of functions that we can use to draw um, to the canvas element. Um, so we can say um, uh, document dot get element by ID. Um, we know that the ID is screen, of course. We set that up before in the HTML. Um, and then we use this get context incantation, which will give us a nice bundle of functions that will let us draw to the screen. Functions like fill rect, which will draw a rectangle and so on. Now let's set up our draw loop. Um, now we want to draw 60 times a second. We want a nice fast draw loop. So we can use request animation frame to set that up for us. Now what does that mean? Well, our basic idea is that we want a draw function. And the draw function will just, you know, draw some stuff. Um, but if we call draw once, then we're just going to draw that stuff once and then and then never update the drawing again. So so that's no good. Um, so this that, but that will get us that far. So what we need to do is tell draw to run again later. And we can use a nice browser API called request animation frame. And what request animation frame is, is says it says, hey browser, please call this function draw uh, again in the very near future. So now what's going to happen is we're going to call draw once, we draw some stuff, and then we call request animation frame to schedule the next draw. The browser in the very near future will call draw again, which means we draw some stuff and then we schedule the next draw, and so on ad infinitum. And the browser aims to do this repetition at about 60 frames a second, which is a nice uh, repetition for a draw loop. So that, that's our basic thing. Now we want to make a uh, do, do some actual drawing. So we'll make a draw tracks function which takes the screen, which, which is uh, what to draw to, and then the uh, data to use to draw. Um, so let's create draw tracks. Perfect. Now, the idea here is that we just want to loop through all of our tracks um, and draw each button in each track. So let's loop through all the tracks first. using for each. And the item passed into each for each invocation is going to be our track. Um, but we also get this nice handy index variable that tells us what row we're in right now, which will become useful in a second. Uh, then, of course, we can loop through all the steps on a track. Um, nice and easy. Uh, and the elements here are going to be whether that track is, sorry, whether the button that we're on right now inside the track is on or off. So that'll be whether it's yellow or gray. Um, and also a handy column index too, which again will be useful. Um, now we want to uh, actually draw a specific button. So this outer loop will take us through the tracks, the each one row, each row. And then this inner loop will take us through the buttons for a specific track. So let's draw a button. Uh, and the button we know is going to need a screen to be drawn, uh, it's going to need a column and a row, and it's going to need some sort of colour. Um, now, we have all of those elements except the colour, and the colour is actually pretty easy, because basically if the colour, if the track is, sorry, if the button is on, then we want to draw it in whatever the track colour is, um, and if it's off, we would just want to draw it in nice light grey, like that. So that feels pretty good, but there's no draw button. That's fair enough. Let's define it. Now, um, we've got a column and a row, which uh, if we just hop over to our example, then this column and row will be 0, 0. This will be 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and so on. You know, this one might be 
um, let's see, uh, 3, 2, and so on. So, um, But we want to draw a rectangle at a particular position, and the way the canvas works is in pixels. So the actual pixel position for this rectangle, the top left of it, might actually be sort of you know, 200, 300, or something like that. So we need to convert those row and column indices into pixels. So let's do that. And we're going to do that with um, button position, which takes a column and a row. Uh, which doesn't exist, uh, the button position function. We can draw it, we can uh, instantiate it though. Now, what do we do here? Well, um, we're just going to return some sort of object which has an X and a Y. And those are the X and Y pixel positions of this particular button that got passed in. Now, each one is, is reasonably simple. We want the buttons to start half a button's width in from the left. So that means button size oops, divided by two. Uh, and then we want each one to be um, a button apart, of course. So that's going to be column times button size. But we want to space them half a button's width from each other. So we multiply button size by 1.5, and we're good to go. Oops. Um, same for row. and we just need to define button size as whatever we want it to be, which uh, I have to know that 26 is a, is a nice number. Now I've got button position. Let's draw that button. So we're going to set the um, fill style of screen. And this just says, hey, please, whenever you fill anything in, like a rectangle like we're about to do, fill it with this color. And the color is whatever we specified, so yellow or light gray, depending. Um, and then we actually need to fill that rectangle in. And we just provide the position and the width and the height. So position is the one we've already calculated. And width and the height is button size. All right. So we've got our first track drawing. So that feels pretty nice. Um, thing is, though, we want to interact with this drum machine. And, 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 and we've got some nice sounds, um, but we're, we're not playing them yet. And more importantly, we're not being able to turn on any buttons or turn them off or anything like that. So let's solve that problem. Um, do some navigation comments um, and now let's say handle events now the way we want to handle events is just respond to clicks so the idea here is that when you click on a button it goes on and when you click on a button again it goes off um, so we're going to use um, the uh, just create a function to hold it all together. Uh, and we're going to use uh, event listeners to do this. So what we care about is clicks. So when a click happens, then do something. And each time a click happens, we get this event E, which tells us, well, crucially for us, where it happened, where that click happened. So the X and the Y position. So we can create that. Um, so the position is uh, the x is e dot client x and the y is e dot client y, like that. Now what we want to do is we want to figure out which button was clicked on, if any. And to do that, we can just whiz through all the buttons again, just like we did for the drawing of the track. So let's start with that code. Uh, and then instead of drawing a button, of course, we want to check out, hey, did this click happen where we think it did? Or did this click happen in a particular button? So we remember we're going through the tracks for this uh, iteration, um, and then we're going through one specific track steps for this one. So a step corresponds to a button. So we can test this specific button for whether or not the click happened on this specific button. And if it did, then we, we toggle its value. So first we say, like, well, hey, um, is point in button? like that. We pass it the P and we pass it um, some sort of button. Now um, the button itself we know is just going to be a column and a row. So if that's true then we know that the button got clicked. Now what do we want to do in response to that? Well super easy we just want to set its boolean value to the inverse of whatever it was before so if it was true then now we want it to be false if it was false we want it to be true so we can just say uh, track.steps and we can get the uh, column 
and we can set it to the inverse of on, which is being passed in here. So that feels pretty nice. But we're missing something. We're missing is point and button. So if we click, then nothing happens. because we're not invoking setup button clicking. Okay, great, now we click and we get an error, so that's great. So is point and button is not defined. Now let's go and define it. Okay, so we know that we're getting some sort of point P and then a column and a row. So we need to get the position of the button. So we're going to say button position, column and row. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to decide, hey, did this particular position, P, is it inside the button? Now, how do we do that? Well, um, let's use my favorite mo Emacs mode, artist mode. So imagine we've got a button here, like that. Uh, now, and then we imagine we've got a click here that happens somewhere like here. We know that that click didn't happen inside the button if it's to the left of the left of the button. Similarly, we know that if the click was somewhere up here, it couldn't have been inside the button if it was above this line. And again, if it was somewhere around this side, we know it couldn't have been inside the button if it was to the right of this line, and then finally down here if it's below this line. Now, if we test all of those and any of them come up true, we know the click wasn't inside the button, and we can just say, nope, it wasn't inside the button. But if they come up all false, if all the tests come up false, we know the click was inside the button. And that's the strategy we're going to use to figure this stuff out. So we're just going to return some sort of single Boolean which is the inverse of something, as we just saw. Um, and so our first test is, hey, um, is the x of the point less than the uh, x of the button? Uh, if it is, then it wasn't inside the button. Similarly, is the y less than the button's y? And then we just need to check the right-hand side and the bottom side. So we can say, hey, is p.x less than button.x uh, plus button size, or is p dot y, sorry, greater than, p dot y greater than the button dot y plus button size. If any of those come up true, then the point, the click is not inside the button. If they all come up false, then the click is inside the button. So now we can refresh that. We've got a button position and that's working. So you can see that we can click these buttons on and off and that's working really nicely. Great, so we're, we're making excellent progress, but we haven't done any sound for a while, so, so let, let's solve that problem. Um, now, uh, what we want to do is we know that we, we had that, that, per, that pink uh, rectangle that was defining where we were stepping, so let's do the pieces that we need for that. Um, now, for that, we're going to need to make an update loop. This is all strange because we've already kind of got two loops here. We've got, we've got an event handling loop here that is being run uh, to handle clicks. And, and then we've got this, this draw loop that's running 60 times a second. And now we're going to create a third loop, uh, the update loop. And this update loop is going to run every time we want to step forward. So that pink rectangle um, in the example steps forward pretty fast at every 100 milliseconds. So it's like bop, 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 like that. So we want to update where it should be. But we're going to create a third um, event loop to do that for us. And if this application was a little more complicated, I would unify the event handling, the updating, and the drawing to a single loop, just to make it easier to understand what was going on. Um, but that would actually, to get it running for this smaller application, would require a fair amount of boilerplate to time all these events correctly. So it's actually easier just to use something like set interval as our final way of creating a loop just to say, hey, I just want to step every 100 milliseconds. And that's like super easy, super easy to understand. Um, so now let's do that. Now what we're going to do is remember that step is just a, a, um, an index into uh, what row, sorry, what column we're in. So it's 0, then it's 1, then it's 2, then it's 3, and, and so on. So let's set that up. 
So we can say data.step is whatever it was plus one. It's not quite that simple because we want it to loop back to the beginning super fast. So we want it to go from the 16th button on the right, right back to the zeroth button, uh, sorry, to the first button immediately. So we can use mod to do that for us. So we can just say, hey, let's get the number of steps in the track to do that. Uh, and let's console.log data.step to see how that's working. Okay, great. So we're just going up, 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 up. Okay, so that's great. So it's going from 0 to 15 and then back to 0 again. So that's, that seems to be working nicely. Now let's draw it. So we're going to hop over to the draw code here. Um, and we're going to say, hey, let's draw a button. Let's draw that pink button. Um, and the, we need to pass in the screen to do the drawing. Now the uh, column is going to be whatever the data dot step is. And the row is going to be um, uh, how many tracks we've got. So we just want to say, and we need to pass in a color, which is deep pink. That will do our button for us. Whoops. Now what's going on here? Well, seems a bit weird. Seems things seem to be sort of working, but sort of not working at the same time. Um, the stepping seems to be happening, but uh, there's a lot of pink rectangles hanging around. Why is that? Well, it's very simply because we're forgetting to clear away our old drawing from our canvas before we draw our new drawing. It's a very easy fix. We can just say clear rect. And we just clear a rectangle from the top left to the bottom right. And that should do the trick. So that's looking great. That's working really nicely. So now the stepping is working. And the final piece really is to is to get that stepping to, to, to do some sound. Um, so that's going to be in our update loop too. So we step, but then we need to play the appropriate sounds. And that's actually reasonably straightforward. We can just say, hey, let's go through all the tracks. And let's keep all the ones using a, oops, keeping a filter. Uh, let's keep all the ones that are actually on right now. Now what does on mean? Well, on just means that for the current step we're on, do, does this specific track have a yellow button? Now the answer at this step at the moment is actually no for all the tracks, so no sounds would play. But once the stepper would get over to here, then the answer would be yes for that track. And so on that moment, when that step happens, this sound would play, whatever sound was associated with this track. So let's make that work. Um, so we can just say, hey, this is going to be a track, and hey, is your track on right now? And we just get the current step. Now that will return true or false automatically because that sh it will already be a Boolean value for whether or not that step is on. And then we just for each each one of those, uh, we just say, hey, please track, play your sound. All right. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, so that sounds excellent. Let's stop that for a second. Now the final piece is to actually make kind of a drum machine of it. So let's 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 define a new sound. Let's define the kick sound. Now, kick is just going to have a single frequency. We don't we don't want to define it. It's going to have a duration of two. Uh, it's going to be a sine wave as well. Um, and the the crucial difference here is um, we're actually going to uh, set the. Um, gee, I forgot to set the uh, frequency of this sine wave. My bad. Um, So that's the note thing, it wasn't setting the frequency, so it's just choosing a default one. So that should uh, come in useful in a second. Anyway, back to the sine wave, the kick wave, uh, drum. Uh, so what I want to do with this sine wave is a kick has this sound like boom, boom. So 
So there's two kind of crucial things there. A, it's super low, so it's going to have a low frequency. And B, the frequency actually drops during the sound. So it may start at a frequency of, say, 160, but it will go down to a much lower frequency during its sound. And that's what produces that kick sound type quality. So we need to, we need to model that, because at the moment our sine wave for our kick here just stays at the same frequency. Um, so the way we can do that is we can use our ramp down function again. But this time, instead of operating on the gain of the amplifier, which we will still use it to use, still use it to do, um, then it's going to operate on the uh, on the uh, frequency of this of this sound. So I'm going to pass in the audio again. Uh, I'm going to pass in the sine the sine wave, um, and we want to pass in the uh, start frequency, which is going to be, like I say, super low, 160, and then the duration, which is the same, uh, of uh, two seconds there. Um, and then I've just made it slightly louder, just to, so that we can hear it properly. Um, so that, that's the kick sound pretty much defined. Now we need to use it. Um, and the way we can do that is just uh, add it to our data array. So I'm going to add a new track here. Uh, I'm going to make it in Dodger Blue, so to distinguish it. Uh, and I'm going to, instead of creating a normal note, a uh, melodious note, then we're just going to create a kick drum there. So now when we refresh, we've got two tracks, so that's great. Okay, so we've got a slight problem here. So what it's saying is set value at time is not a function on the item that we're trying to call it on, which totally makes sense, because if we just hop back to the kick drum here, you can see that I'm passing in the whole sine wave. Now, that is not something that ramp down can operate on, because remember that... Um, ramp down here expects an item where it sets value at time. Now, the sine wave itself is not a value that you can set, but you can set the frequency. So um, that will make sense now. Okay, let's try again. All right. So you can just hear that there. Okay, so we've got a nice, nice kick track now. And we can add a sound. Okay, so that's pretty cool. But again, let's just do the final piece, which is just to add some more notes so that we can make a bit of a tune. Okay, that's super simple now that we've got our note function set up. And we're just going to add the notes of the pentatonic scale. Um, so there's a few more of those to add in. And I happen to know the frequencies of the pentatonic scale handily off, off by heart. Uh, 523, JK, I've got them written down here. Um, 587 and 659 and 880. Okay, so we should get a few more tracks now, and now we can make a, a nicer track. To browse the code and to see a working version, go to drum-machine.maryrosecook.com. Thanks for watching.